Uh, so thank you for having me and for considering this bill. And I want to thank Peggy for her help in facilitating me being here. Um, and the three folks who spoke before, Ray, William, and Carolyn, I just want to acknowledge that I heard you and heard your, your stories and thank you for sharing your stories. Um, I, what you're gonna hear from me today is going to be in one particular different than what you heard from the three folks who spoke before the break and yet perhaps very similar. In the summer of 1983, social services managed to get me out of my home. I was about to turn 10 years old, and this wasn't the first time that they had attempted to free me from the physical abuse that was my daily experience in my father and stepmother's home. They had tried before, and they had failed because I had lied to protect the silence that is an integral part of child abuse. I lied about the starvation, about being locked out in bitter winter weather without proper clothing, about being hit. I protected my abuser, hiding the nights I slept naked on the floor in the hallway, how I had no friends, and how I had to eat my own vomit. I had attempted suicide a few times, but I only did it in ways that could look like an accident because if I failed, I would get in trouble for trying to kill myself. Fortunately, every single car I jumped in front of stopped in time, so I'm here. But death seemed the only way out because I couldn't even imagine a scenario in which I would break the code of silence that I lived under. That was not even something I could picture. The only reason I got out was because I had dirty underwear and socks, because I was eating the other kids lunch at school and their parents were packing more food because they were going home and telling them I had no lunch every day. Because I smelled so bad, there was no other explanation for it. I only got out because my physical condition told the truth I was unable to speak. And so other people acted. And I want to, in this moment, um, honor those folks, some of whom may be watching today. I told you the year 1983, because I want you to understand that almost four decades has done nothing to make that abuse less a part of who I am. I wake up every morning an adult survivor of child abuse. I hike the mountains of Vermont as an adult survivor of child abuse. I raise my children as an adult survivor of child abuse. I enjoy Dolly Parton and Bruce Springsteen as an adult yeah. survivor of child abuse. It is not all of who I am, but it will forever be a part of my identity. I will always feel her nails digging into my cheek as she grabbed me, always. I'm one of the lucky ones. First, someone was able to get me out. But second, those who spoke up for me gave me the gift of naming the abuse which has allowed me to speak openly about what happened. I do so very often because I find it reduces the stigma for others. We are not broken is the message I bring. We are changed, we are molded by our abuse, but we are not damaged goods. Many people cannot speak of it as I do. Every time I speak or write about my abuse, at least one person comes forward to say to me, it happened to me too. Sometimes they say it loudly, but usually they wait for the room to clear out or contact me later. Sometimes it's the first time they have ever said it out loud. Survivors of physical abuse often get the message their abuse was not as serious as sexual abuse. This is a false narrative that heightens the shame and the silence. For me, the saddest moments have to do with the men who talk to me. Men in their 40s and their 50s, men who have raised entire families. They look at me and they, they whisper it. You're the only person I've ever told this other than my wife. I wish I could tell you've only heard that once or twice, but I've heard it again and again. The shame and the silence for men is even worth, worse than for women. They have gone decades without being able to name the crime that was committed against them. 
And that is because the code of silence is part of the crime. It's the heart of the crime. That shame and silence is a prerequisite to the hitting, the starving, the damage to the body. And that shame and silence lives on for decades afterwards. You cannot have a statute of limitations on a crime that by its very nature silences the only witness for decades. S99 will let survivors know that we as a society do not diminish the terrible crime that was committed against them. And we will not be complicit in the silence that was forced upon them. It will give them the time they need to say the words they need to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. Questions for Emily? Emily, you're <clears throat> very succinct. And can we talk a little bit more about the nature of the silence? Um, I... Yeah. So you have to build the silence before you can start the abuse. Because a child who doesn't understand the never even spoken rule, or sometimes not spoken rule, of you don't talk, will talk. I mean, I have three kids. They talk about pretty much everything that happens in my house all the yeah. time. And so you have to build the silence first. It's built in. And so by the time, and, and it's a testing thing, right? You, it's like a frog in boiling water, right? You, you start it, you start it with the silence, you start it with the fear, you start it with that. And then by the time the physical abuse starts, you know you can never talk about what happened. You know it in every fiber of your being. And it's a tremendous fear. And the only reason that I was able to step away from that fear is I wasn't going back to that house for two months because the first investigation, the social workers insisted I went to overnight camp for the summer. So they understood the removal and the fact that, I mean, I would go into the principal's office the first time around and my stepmother was sitting outside the door. That silence was not gonna be broken. And so I was given a gift, one that I'm a very open person by nature and just the way I came out was like that. But two, that I had other people break that silence and name it and put me in a position. But even at overnight camp, I was able to name it when the social workers came to talk to me. But when I had to be in the same room with my father and stepmother, I clammed up, silenced, didn't say it, couldn't say it, even though I had been telling the truth up until then. And we call it disclosing and a lot, you know, this is something that, you know, a lot of times I have encountered with, with children or survivors is, is the capacity to disclose is so difficult because it's such an implicit rule. And so, you know, when Ray was speaking, it was incredibly powerful to me because he spoke about so much of what I have seen. And I have become in a lot of ways a very public child abuse survivor. Um, I've written about it in all sorts of really public places. I'm a writer and so I've had that ability. And so I become um, an unofficial helper where I become a place where people can talk about it safely. And it's heartbreaking how hard it is to name it decades and decades later. When you left your father and stepmother's house permanently, that was the state of Vermont that took you? Um, no? State of Massachusetts. Oh, okay. And, and Massachusetts at the time had this thing. They just loved to keep the family together. So it's an indicator. Well, Vermont suffers from that too. Yeah. And sometimes, listen, like sometimes I get it. There's a lot of factors. But it was at the time, you know, people didn't even know if they'd be able to get me out and it was extreme. Um, and so after the state of Massachusetts took you out of the home, they placed you in a, what, a foster home or? 
I went to live with my paternal grandparents for okay. a short time, and then another relative took me. So kinship care. Yeah. Other questions for Emily? No, I just have to say that all of this, this and the what we were dealing with, with the um, uh, pornography, child pornography and stuff, I just, I just cannot, it is just unfathomable to me what we do to children. Senator Benning. Emily, I, I don't um, have a question for you, but to you and all the witnesses that have come, you have all been uh, very convincing in your testimony. But Emily, I'm gonna single you out because you have a wonderful way of articulating in a very short um, presentation language that I think comes popping into my head as to how to address this and articulate it further. So while I thank all of the witnesses we've heard from over the past two days, frankly, for the, the passion and your courage to bring forward this conversation, um, I, was, I just wanna single you out by saying you have a gift for articulating the message, press on. Thank you. <clears throat> Senator Nick, did you? No, I just wanted to say thank you very much, everyone. Very unique, very unique stories, really, even though the common theme, but how the individual part of it is so important for us to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's very important that we hear this. I'm sorry that the rest of the Senate is unable to hear the stories that we're hearing because I think it's important that they you know, <clears throat> have a full understanding of, of the impact of some of the laws we pass and some of our efforts to prevent child abuse. Uh, we have focused on child detention tended to not look at child physical abuse the same way and neglect, by the way. A lot of what I heard today was also neglect. It wasn't just, and what I heard from you, Emily, is, is also neglect. It's not just physical abuse. It's neglect. How, how you can leave a kid with a broken arm for two weeks or a little girl with pus coming out of her ears before you do anything Thank you. All Thank you all so much. Thank you, Emily. And keep writing. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. 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 I, you know, this has been a tough. This subject is extremely difficult. Even think that what you're doing is going to make a difference with S99. Many of the people who might be involved in this. Emily, since you're from Massachusetts, wouldn't actually benefit from this bill. Because it's. I, I'm okay with that. It's the, you know, it's really about, like Ray said, it's the kids to come. You know, when this pandemic hit, when this pandemic hit and we closed everything down, it was so re-triggering for every survivor I know because the rest of you, the rest of you saw businesses shutting down and the rest of you saw education interrupted and every one of us saw doors slamming on children who were now stuck in their house with their abusers. All of us and we, the survivors, we talk about this. We all know what this year has done to those kids. And I just, you know, we, the idea that that door shut and they, those kids were told school has closed indefinitely, you're staying home. I mean, school was the only thing that got you out. And now we've done this. 
And I'm grateful to the superintendents who did everything they could to try to serve the kids through this year, through this awful year when those doors were shut and those kids were stuck in that house. But it's not, a, it, I don't need legal recourse, I'm okay. You know, like Ray writing about it and talking about it and working constantly to, to pay it forward has, has been helpful to me. But I need to know that those kids for this last year where the door was shut will have recourse whenever they find their words. And, and, and I need to know that some kid is gonna read that you passed this bill and that you're willing to give them the time they need to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Eric. Um... I don't know if we, uh, you know, we put aside some time next Wednesday and it might be better. I don't have any changes to make right now. I am. Um, do we? Do I have know what one technical? Piece yeah. Here. yeah, please. Just, just, just as a starting point, um, yes. you may recall that uh, there was testimony that I think there's been fairly consistent testimony about the um, possible uh, ambiguity. Because you remember the, and I can pull up the bill for a moment if that would be helpful, just yep. to remind everybody of the language. Although actually, it's it's really in in the statute. You remember that the, the way the bill defines um, assault is with reference to the criminal aggravated assault statute. Yeah. Remember that? And yep. there was and there was language in that statute regarding attempts that made it uh, kind of ambiguous as to what that really meant. Yeah. Uh, so I think it, at least from a technical just sort of one possible amendment for the committee to think about in response to that is to redraft um, the language just so that the attempt stuff is is taken out, so that that doesn't doesn't preserve that ambiguity. Um, I think that would respond to the concern that was expressed by folks. Um, yeah, I, I think <clears throat> you're going to go back forty years and try to prove an attempt, right? Exactly. And it's going to be different. Uh, difficult to know. Um, you know, take Carolyn's case. It's 1950s. It's going to be. I don't know how you could possibly prove an attempt. Right. But I, I had a thought of how to how to reword that so that the, the I'm sure attempt. You can is... do, I'm sure you can. Um, right. <laughs> that's one of your one of your many talents. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but I. Yeah, that. And how does one prove? I mean, I can think of um, somebody whose arm was broken. You know, there's maybe there's ways to prove that. Um, some of the other physical abuse. Do you know of, of were there or not cases on the child sexual abuse that um, had problems proving? I think that that you know, uh, absent cases where the evidence is obvious, um, proof is always always going to be uh, an issue. Um, I'm not sure that there's a lot you can do about that. Um, the uh, uh, but to the extent that you can have other contemporaneous witnesses, or if, if you can have the fact that somebody mentioned it to somebody else contemporaneously, or even that they've mentioned it to somebody else sometime since then, uh, uh, those, those factors can go in to supporting someone's claim. But I think you, you, you know, there always has to be some evidence that the claim happened. Uh, but I think at least by removing the statute of limitations, you've allowed that evidence to be gathered and presented. In a way, and now now it couldn't can't even be presented. So, uh, it, you know, to the extent that there's anything available, you've at least um, made that 
ability to present that to a court. What is the statute of limitations on reporting? Physical abuse? Uh, well, I don't know that or it's a... It's a yeah, I, I don't... The so it's, a minor, it's a really a misdemeanor to fail to report. Then I think it would be the ordinary statute of limitations on crimes generally is three years. I'm wondering if... But, on they a are, certain side of this, if if someone could prove a, a pattern by an institution to urging failure, to, urging to not report physical or sexual abuse, right? Holding also, the institution culpable for well, it sounds like Kern Hatton itself at least at some point in its history, um, through the Catholic Church as well, um, there's all, all obviously evidence. Their failure to report abuse, they, they established, I'm trying to think of the words, but I guess the word would be a culture where you did not report abuse. We heard time and time again from people saying that they were... <clears throat> You know, if you if you report that I broke your arm, I'll I'll, uh, I'll cut you up in pieces and throw you in the current hat and swamp. Right. Right. This morning, but I'm I believe that um, that may have been a culture there at current hat to not report abuse, which is yeah, it sounds at like at least at some time at some point in its history. I, I you know I can't knock you. I think also there's a, there's a general principle with respect to statute of limitations. I think uh, Attorney O'Neill might have mentioned it last week of concealment. So the statute of limitations doesn't run while someone is concealing the, the wrongdoing or the claim. So it's called tolling is the legal term that's used, T-O-L-L. -L. But it's, for example, statute of limitations is tolled while someone is a minor. So it doesn't start running until someone turns 18. Similarly, while someone is concealing that someone has a claim or the concealing the facts underlying it, the statute is told. So uh, uh, it could well be that uh, there might be a claim for failing to report uh, based on the fact that they were concealing, which it certainly sounds like from the testimony the committee's heard yeah. is exactly what was happening. I have one other question for the committee to think about, just because it's also come up a lot from the testimony and it was a drafting question, was whether uh, is the emotional abuse issue. And you know, that's a, obviously a different one that wouldn't be covered by the assault statute, but I think that's not something to answer now, but just wanted to- no, I, Well, I looked at some of the statutes regarding abuse. There's the uh, vulnerable adults as some emotional abuse statute, I believe. But I, I would think that would be much harder. I think that's right, correct. And I, and I would, I, I'm concerned about unintended consequences. Having been sued in my own life, <laughs> a pleasant thing to go through, even when you're not guilty. Um, and I, I, and I, um, I think, yeah, I think you're right. The, the proof issue that you were mentioning, much more difficult. Uh, on, on, from all, for all parties when it comes to the emotional side. We can, I'm certainly happy to look at it, but I think, can I, is there anywhere else that, Joe, do you know? On the civil arena, I'm, I'm, I know we need to tweak this to some extent just to make sure it's okay. I, I would like to be able to leave 
uh, Ray and Emily uh, and Kim with the understanding that we are all moving in the same direction, even though we end up with some tweaks that have to be made. Those tweaks are very minor in the, the way we're, we're moving forward. I, I sense there is unanimity in the committee um, that goes along with where all these witnesses have been begging us to go. So I, I would hate them to leave the screen wondering if we're going to get hung up on some technicality, because I don't think we're no. going to. We'll iron those details out. But, you know, at the end of the day, proof is always a burden. And it doesn't matter what we have for um, the target, be it sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse. It is always up to the plaintiff to construct a case I see this bill as simply enabling them to enter into the process and try to make that case. As a defense attorney, I'm also cognizant that there will be defense attorneys down the road who are trying to battle from the other way. But at the end of the day, it is always up to the trier of fact to decide who wins. All that we're doing is we are opening up the door for somebody to make a case that currently is closed to them. I'll leave it there. I appreciate that. I haven't, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I never physically abused a kid in my four years of working in juvenile court. I did restrain some teens. I may have um, made some mistakes, but I don't know. Yeah, I think, though, the, the difference is that there is going to have to be, in assembling a case, something of substance, not just a mere allegation. Because if you don't have the substance to back up the allegation, in all likelihood, a defense attorney is going to convince a judge that there's no merit to the case. Um, but at the end of the day, that, that gatekeeper, the judge, is still there to protect interests of folks like you who may have that accusation made. And, you know, I, I remember one time there was a staff member who um, forcibly removed the kid from the window as he was trying to remove himself from the building through the window. And the kid alleged that the staff member had abused him when pulling him out of the window. Um, the you know, DCF was called and they did an they did an investigation on, on the staff member who was considered to have just been doing his job and trying to prevent the kid from running away. Um, but uh, you know that's that's like an al allegation where you do have at least hopefully there's some record of that incident. That's one that sticks in my mind as an example. I don't think there was any intent other than to prevent him from running away. Think about it. That nervousness that you have as somebody who could be sued is palpable in the current situation of where our statute of limitations would allow that kind of an action to be brought. Yeah. We are always going to have situations where we are uncomfortable, but should we deny someone with a valid claim to bring it beyond the present limitations of our statute of limitations? No, I, I, I wasn't suggesting that I would oppose the bill or anything. Yeah, I was I, just reminding, you know, I'm just thinking of my own situation. And what things I've done. Um, I'm only suggesting that you, you might have some comfort in the idea that their case did not amount to abuse at the time that you initially heard about it. And in my eyes, wouldn't amount to abuse 30 years down the road. Um, I will also mention as I did yesterday, feeling like uh, I was one of the fortunate ones adopted it. 
the mother who was incarcerated. And, uh, and uh, you know, 18 months in a series of foster homes. You do know that because I've gone back to find my history. Got lucky top of my farm. So I was never, to my knowledge, ever in an institution. <clears throat> Part of what drives me on this. Anyway, um, if we could um, take a just try to go back to 128, see where we're at. Uh, 128. Yeah, 128. Which minutes. one is that again? That's the uh, panic defense. Oh, yeah. Thank you all Thank again you. for having me. Uh, I appreciate you. the opportunity to have the survivors yeah, and forward as well. Brent, if you, uh, Kim, if you want to stay in touch with Eric and myself on any um, suggested, you know, once you take a look at the St. Joseph's format, I, I think supporting the survivors is one thing we can do almost immediately. <clears throat> And I appreciate that so much on behalf of all of them. I know they will be very grateful for that. I also have some, some ideas based upon what you all are talking about and just we're talking about with respect to failing to report and the pattern and procedures of that that I'd be happy to share with you uh, at another time. Yeah, next Wednesday, I believe, 10.45. be a great Thank time. To... Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All the folks who testified today, I appreciate it very much. I know the committee does. Yes, thank you very much. They were they were powerful and brave, and I commend them they for it. They were. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye now. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Bryn. Thank you. Dick, did you, uh, you cut out, did you um, say we were taking a break or not? No. Okay. It seemed, it seemed like you did and then your voice. Oh, I'm sorry. Fuzzed out no. and I couldn't tell. Sometimes your voice, yeah. because you lower your voice and you're so far from the mic, we can't hear you. Yeah, I'm trying to be close to it. I don't know what happened. <laughs> you, lo you lower your voice when you're oh, I go off and, yeah. and remember like that. Yeah, I know. Um, right. So one last quick question before I go, Senators. That was, are you? Am I right that we're, so we're going to do markup next week? You don't not going to look at a new draft yet? Just sort of, or what's no, your we'll do markup next Wednesday? Okay. Um, but you you could do a draft. Um, we definitely want to make sure attempts are not involved. Right. <clears throat> so I think you could do that. If you want to think a little bit about on the uh, issue of mandatory reporters in an institution where it's proven that the culture is to not report. I sure hope that has changed. I mean, I mean, there, you know, even in schools, there was something not that long ago whereby you had to go through the staff rather than a teacher calling direct and right. find that change too. In, in our education committee, that got changed. Yeah. We could do, you know, something in the bill to clear, you know. I don't know. It seems like there was a culture to not report, and I think we ought to address it, even if it's by report. Or whatever. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, we're joined by uh, Bryn Hare and looking back at S H one twenty eight again, which I believe we're scheduled to take up again next Friday, um, or hopefully to, to make final amendments to the bill. I guess um, we were talking about whether or not what impact it has to be discussing the differences between sentencing and prosecution for it. How do you? I mean, defendants have all kinds of 
things that a judge might take into consideration when making a decision. Um, and the question is, should they be able to um, <clears throat> bring the panic defense up for the sentencing? Is there anything else we deny the defense the right to, to raise? Anybody yeah. know? What, what do we deny? Um, so the, the example I brought up earlier, um, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, um, the, the, what I brought up earlier was the rape shield law, um, which prohibits the defense from introducing certain types of evidence um, about a, a victim's sexual history in a case, um, is that's one example of evidence that we that we don't allow to be introduced. But could could the defendant could a defendant raise? So that that criminal. would typically be introduced by the defendant um, in order to demonstrate something about the victim um, as a as a defense. At sentencing, though, at sentencing or at prosecution. So the um, the rape shield statute applies to um, the criminal trial, uh, prohibiting that the introduction of that evidence at the criminal trial. Mm -hmm. What about the sentence? So um, my reading of that statute is that it applies to the trial, um, but my understanding is that if that evidence isn't introduced at the trial, I'm not sure that a judge would have it at the sentencing proceeding. Um, since it is, um, it wouldn't be a part kind of the of like I'm so, thinking of you're a defendant who has been a victim of rape and you killed somebody because you were, uh, because they were attempting to rape you or you felt they were attempting. Wouldn't you be able to use that as a Yes. So will you, will you tell me that fact pattern again? I'm sorry. I the, de the defendant killed somebody whom they thought was trying to rape them. Oh, yes. So that, right, that would be a self-defense. Um, right. Defense. And you could use all that information, your, your history, you, you were raped as a, whatever, as, as an adopted child or whatever. You can use all that information in the sentencing phase. Right, the inter mm -hmm. yes, introduction so, of the evidence of your own sexual history. Yeah. Of the defendant's own so sexual history, yes. Somebody who um, I'm confused by that. Yeah. Could I? Yeah. yeah, can you help me? Senator White, go ahead. Then so Senator I, I just, I'm a little confused here and maybe Joe can help me about how this actually happens at a, at a trial. So you're prohibited from um, introducing certain things during the, the actual trial. Um, and that's the rape shield. Um, and, and in this case, it would be the, the panic defense. You're, you can't introduce it at trial. When it comes to sentencing, can only things that have been introduced at trial be permitted to be told to the judge i'm my me or my attorney um, at sentencing can i introduce um the the state of my mind or something else to the judge that hasn't been brought up at trial i guess i'm i'm confused here because it seems to me that you want the judge to have lots and lots of information. Um, yes, I, I did this, but I have been going to rehab now for the six months since I was charged with this and I'm a changed person or what, whatever it is. I, I don't understand exactly how that works at an actual trial and the sentencing phase. The only easy way to describe it, Jeanette, is at the trial phase, you are talking about guilt or innocence. Right. Doesn't go beyond that. We have given limitations to what kind of evidence can be produced 
to determine guilt or innocence. And when you get to the sentencing phase, you are now trying to develop a plan of action to accommodate the person who has been convicted. It's a totally different environment in my eyes. Um, I, off the top of my head, I cannot recall any time where I've been prevented from introducing something. I'm not aware as I'm sitting here of any law that would prevent me from introducing something. The judge is free to discard it and say, I'm sorry, I just don't buy into what you're giving me as an excuse of whatever kind here. But we've never limited to my knowledge the ability of a judge to consider something or reject it if the judge feels that's appropriate. Remembering this is no longer about guilt or innocence, it's about what do you do with this individual who has now been convicted? And when we as a legislature try to uh, fashion legislation that really ties the hands of a judge, um, that I, I'm very uncomfortable going down that road at all. That, that's not just bad in this situation. It is the potential for future tying of a judge's hands based on emotional reactions to a given uh, societal ill at any moment in time. And I, I find that very troubling. And if Philip is correct, that in fact, the house language is um, allowing that to be carried over into sentencing, then I'm, I'm thinking that I've got to take another look at this bill because I'm just not feeling comfortable going down the road we're going. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, Mr. Chair? Yep. Yeah, um, this discussion really makes me feel like we need testimony from Judge Grierson at least um, because I, I take Joe's experience, but I share some of uh, Senator White's questions about how the process works. And I would I would be you know, personally comforted to hear what what Judge Grierson thinks of this. I'm not sure, um, Bryn, do you know if he testified in the House on this? <clears throat> uh, no, I don't believe that he did testify on this bill in the House. Um, I, I would like to uh, share with the committee a, a case, the provost case, that provides that all, um, all facts that um, that pertain to sentencing have to be determined beyond a reasonable doubt um, at the trial phase. Um, so I would just, I would, I understand that there are certain things that come in at the sentencing phase that may not come in at the trial phase. Um, but I think any facts that are relevant to um, the actual determination of all of the elements of the crime do have to be established beyond a reasonable doubt by the jury. So I can share that case with the committee. Brian, I just want to, um, caveat to that, that I'm pretty sure that case is what limits the prosecution. Uh, the prosecution cannot bring into a sentencing phase allegations that have not been proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, I, so I, I think there's a strong difference between how that case applies to prosecutors trying to bring in things at sentencing as opposed to the defense bringing in something because the defense is not required to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt at right. any stage. Under, understood. But I would, I would go back to the point I made earlier. If you don't include the sentencing phase, as I understand it, the sentencing phase, part of the, the point is to introduce mitigating factors so that a judge might say, okay, I'm not gonna give 20 years, I'm gonna give five years because of these factors. So that seems like the phase where it would, where you might very likely have defense attorneys trying to mitigate the sentencing with mm -hmm. the panic defense. So if we if we leave that in place, I just feel like the rationale for the bill is severely undercut. Um, Let's I think of the. Can I just raise an example, and then I know, I know we're not going much further, but I'm thinking of the Stanford swimmer who was charged and convicted of a rape, of attempted rape, I believe, of a young girl who was unconscious, uh, inebriated to a point when she was unconscious. He was charged with that um, and uh, convicted. Somebody, uh, some, someone stopped him in the, in the 
process of the rape. When it got to sentencing, though, the judge decided because he was such a good swimmer and because he had no other convictions, I think they gave him a suspended sentence or yeah. six months or something. It was a very light sentence. It became a pretty high profile. So at that point, the judge took all kinds of extraneous information into account in determining a, what appears to be an extremely light sentence. And I'm I not sure that had anything to do with it. Pardon me? Yeah, that, I believe the judge lost his seat over that. Yeah, and I think well deserved. But I, I only raise that because it sounds like stuff that was never proven at trial. Not sure that it ever came up during the trial, whether he was a good swimmer or not a good swimmer. That made a bit of difference. Good student, bad student. So that, you know, I'm just curious about that. How that works. Gonna, what we're talking about. There is a great danger of trying to create legislation based on a rogue judge's actions. Um, I, I will join with Philip and say that we should hear from Judge Grierson, because in my mind, this is no longer determining guilt or innocence. This is what do you do with a person who has been convicted? And there are many different factors that come into play, uh, but to deny outright at the get-go the ability of a defense to present some kind of uh, mitigating discussion, to me, that's, that's uh, one hell of a big step and I, that, I just can't go down that road. So I'd love to hear from Judge Grierson. Well, we're all agreed that the House bill did provide for consideration of sentencing. And the panic defense is part of the defense and sentencing. That's how I read the House version, yes. So for us, the question is whether or not it should the language that Bryn used in her amendment. Well, I would go even farther than the House versus the amendment that um, Bryn did for us, because if if the House if the House bill includes the um, the sentencing, then I would want it explicitly taken out, depending on what we hear from Judge Gerson, because I am very nervous about about not being able to introduce anything from the defense at the sentencing hearing. I mean, if you, if you, have, if you find that the person is guilty, but then find that they have been, and, and I'm not talking here about this defense, but find out that um, they are guilty of doing this, but they were, um, they've been in rehab now for six months or a year and haven't used or haven't done anything that might have an impact on what the sentence is. I would, I'd be very nervous about telling judges what they can and can't look at during, sen during the sentencing, um, because I think we can begin to put restrictions of all kinds then on what they can what they can hear and what they can take into account when they're sentencing, as opposed to the whether they're guilty or innocent. And, and I, I see what you're saying, Jeanette, but I guess my way of looking at it is this bill wouldn't in any way say you can't take into account somebody's history uh, no. in, a, in a substance abuse program or other relevant data. What it would say is that if someone is convicted of violent assault or murder mm -hmm. against a person, and then at the sentencing phase, they say, well, I've been convicted, but you know, I did it because I found out they were gay, and a judge agrees that that should mitigate the sentence, that's inherently bigoted. It's inherently, um, mm -hmm. I, I just view it as something the system shouldn't allow at any phase. It's a qualitatively different thing than information about somebody being an otherwise good member of the community or you know, completing a program of treatment or something like that. I would just say that judge would end up in the same situation as the swimmer case that Dick was talking about. Maybe, depends wh where, where they're sitting, you know? 
Well, I mean, there, there in are, Vermont, I think we there's a sitting in Vermont. They yanked well, out of the retention committee in a heartbeat. We, you know, Vermont has different attitudes in different places. It's, it's, you know, that's our fact, jurisdiction, right? Just, just saying that again. We're back to there are all sorts of bias and levels of bias, um, and so what this bill is trying to do is take that bias out of the out of the picture, but. I, I see what you know you guys are arguing and I think Judge Grierson's um, perspective would be real helpful. The, the problem here is, is that this is a particular bias and it is a particularly obnoxious bias. But if we try to limit um, things that can be presented that have any bias um, by a judge, I, I mean, I don't know where this, where else this would go. I'm sorry, um, I, shot him, but you know, I um, really live in fear of politicians doing bad things to our world and to me. And so um, I shot him because he's a politician. And then we say, well, you can't introduce that. I mean, I, mean, I, I just, I, I get, I think this is, and the other thing I would, um, I think that what we're doing here is, and I, I think this is a, an obnoxious thing for, a judge to, to do to base it on that. But we're looking at these three really high profile cases. And I thought what we heard from Rebecca Turner was that all the cases, if you take the totality of the cases in which this has been used, oftentimes the sentences were higher. And, but we're looking at the three really high profile cases and kind of basing it on that, and that always makes me very nervous when we when we do that around particularly high-profile cases that we find repugnant. And so we should, if it's true that there are many, 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 many cases out there where it didn't work in that direction, we should take that into account as well. That, that's the final word. Center.